Hi, I'm Sophie Marie Odom, Lifestyle Magazine's editor. And I'm Samantha Ring, broadcaster and disability rights campaigner. And a very warm welcome to the Motability Lifestyle Pod. In this podcast, we invite our friends from the disability community into the studio for a conversation on how we can all live our best life, particularly when navigating a disabling world. Today, we are joined by the comedian and model Fats Timbo. With over 2.9 million fans on TikTok, she uses her platform to spread laughter and educate people on questions around disability. We love her. Don't we? Very excited. Very. Hi, Sam. Hello, my darling. How are you? Oh, I've got man flu, which basically means I've got a tiny little cold, but I'm reacting in a really diva, overdramatic way. So I, I'm doing my best. If I start sneezing... You just have to, like, excuse it. How are you? Tell me what is good in the news today. What should we be thankful for? What is bringing us joy? So our first reason to be cheerful is that British sign language users and scientists have created 200 new signs for common environmental terms. So it's hoped that this will make climate and biodiversity science much more accessible for deaf people and could enable deaf people to attend global climate and biodiversity summits and participate in discussions. So at the moment, there's 200 signs for terms like biodiversity, global warming, etc. But by the end of the project, the team hopes that they would have developed more than 400 signs. So this will be themed around energy, sustainability Mm -hmm. and the impact of environmental change on humans and will include signs for global warming, carbon neutral and deforestation i love that i mean i think this should be happening as standard anyway i think bsl i i learned bsl at night school i can only do my level one my two favorite signs were drunk (laughs) which is like you put your two little uh fingers on your palm and wiggle it around like a drunk person i found that fascinating and also tired so i always used to think of myself it's like your boob is falling off put your hand there go tired tired but i loved it and i I oh I feel really disappointed that the UK in particular still doesn't have BSL as standard on news reports or you know just just in in the national curriculum. I mean, as someone who mm. used to teach children languages and a lot of children with intellectual disabilities as well, you know, I actually amalgamated BSL into my learning because a lot of the kids were visual learners, were kinesthetic learners, and it's such a beautiful expression and a lot of my deaf friends have taught me so much and I and I think that it's a huge injustice in the UK that we are not giving more space to the deaf community so this is absolutely incredible very welcome news it's just making climate change conversations just much more accessible because in the past they haven't been and absolutely. disabled people and deaf people and neurodivergent people have felt left out of conversation yeah. so it's nice that there's actually like a space now to involve mm. deaf people and that they can actually attend summits mm-hmm. where big decisions are made that yeah. affect everybody and you know i it's a bit of a cliche and you don't want to kind of say that everyone who's part of the community is, you know, forward thinking. But I would say that most of my deaf, disabled and neurodivergent friends, like we do have to think outside of the box. And like when it comes to innovation, we're probably the best people to get on board for these conversations because we see the world really, really differently because I've got to preempt all, all the hurdles, all the barriers. And I think, you know, the deaf community is exactly the same. And that can only be a positive when it comes to diversity and inclusion when we're talking about such serious um, matters on climate change. So absolutely brilliant. I just hope that this is something that sets the standard exactly. moving forward. I agree. So for those who are interested, a full glossary of signs can be found on the Scottish Sensory Centre website. <laughs> So on to our second reason to be cheerful. Sam, you actually shared this story on your Instagram, didn't you, from BBC yeah, News? Yeah, I'm such a sucker for like a happy, a happy story. I love how that I, you know, you, you just you take, <laughs> take inspiration. Of course, you're inspiring. Not, not only when we're working <laughs> together, but... In Just general. out and about yes. in general. Of course I do. <laughs> so Henrietta Onyema, she's from Bermondsey in London and she started offering food and other supplies after the food bank at her local church had to close. So initially she was using her own money um, mm. to buy these food supplies for the local community. But now she receives donations from local people and supermarkets. This is a story from the BBC and she was quoted saying, some of our neighbours are housebound, they don't really go out much and I knew they needed some help. So she stepped up to the plate mm-hmm. to offer the help. 
And it's just really, this story just comes at a really timely moment with the whole cost of living crisis mm-hmm. and people not being able to afford, you know, mm-hmm. basic necessities and having to turn to food banks. And a recent study by the Joseph Roundtree Foundation found that almost eight out of 10 Londoners on low income are skipping meals or going without essentials. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's amazing that women like Henrietta or people like Henrietta are out there just serving yeah. the community I mean, she is a, an absolute character she actually made me cry a little bit when i watched because i think she i mean I'm, I'm paraphrasing here but i think she said you know if you have what you need and you have more like surplus then why not and that's a very you know christian values and and that's something that i would definitely say that i live my life by i come from a working class um background uh, when my dad passed away that meant that we we didn't have a lot but I've always you know I'm not trying to virtual signal here but I've always really enjoyed I'm a gift giver to begin with that's definitely my German blood like I like gift giving but I think you know when you actually take stock of what you do have it's like well yeah do I need x amount of this yeah. but I think on another level you know just being able to I always compliment people on their outfits or random is in the street. And it's really funny because in London, most people have their headphones in and just block out anyone in existence, you know. <laughs> but I kind of force myself onto people a little bit. I'm like, hi. But I will say to people, oh my God, beautiful dress. Mm-hmm. And you can just tell that that lifts people. Lifts people's spirits, you know? yeah. And I think that costs, kindness costs nothing. I agree. I'm pleased to introduce today's guest. Joining us is content creator, model, comedian, educator and author Fats Timbo. She pulls no punches in her comedy, finding fun in her life and the world around her. She decided to share her top tips for confidence and earlier this year she released her first book, Main Character Energy, 10 Commandments for Living Life Fearlessly. Fats Timbo, great to have you on the Motability Pod. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I've personally watched your journey, which has been phenomenal. Um, So let's start at the very beginning. You're a model, also working in finance and went on the show Undateables. Tell us about that. How was that experience? Because I mean, you mentioned in your book that when you were asked, you didn't know whether to laugh or to cry. Yeah, I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry, but thank you so much for following my journey. I really appreciate (laughs) that. It means a lot. Um, To be honest with you, I'd never done anything like that before in terms of going on TV and it was super scary and super daunting. I was thinking about what are people going to say? What are people going to think? You know, going on a show called The Undateables, that's what I might be called the rest of my life. So that's the reason why I initially said no to it. And a couple months later, I was thinking about it and I was thinking, actually, if I think about the bigger picture, It's about the message I'm going to put across and the representation I'll be giving to people. And that's when I made the decision to call them back. I just thought, okay, what's the worst that can happen? And I think from there, it kind of helps me recognize that I could represent for the underrepresented going on these shows and um, being on social media and doing what I do in terms of dancing, comedy, all that stuff. It kind of was that stepping stone for me. So I'm quite thankful for it, actually. I I love that because I have spoken... Hi, it's Samantha, by the way. (laughs) Hi, Sam. Hiya, baby. All right. I've started reading your book, actually, but I'm waiting for um, a beach holiday um, to actually dive (laughs) right into it. So bear with me. No worries. Um, I've spoken a lot about the undateables and it was, it came out very, very close to when I first moved to London and I very, probably very similar to you, I got unindated with messages on Instagram, like from producers going, do you want to be part of this show called the undateables? And it was very much at the beginning of my journey into TV work, but also my campaign work. And, you know, the elephant in the room obviously was the title and I kind of really, I really dug my heels in and I was like, 
you know, this is not appropriate. And I think it's amazing that you have a completely different narrative. And I think that's great that you are flying the flag for how you experience that. But I, I have to say, I think a lot goes for the person that you are and the fact that you are incredibly tenacious and the fact that you are, you know, a go-getter in life. Um, can I say very similar to myself? <laughs> um, you know, that we, we can make we can make a any situation work in our favour. And I think, you know, I'm so grateful that you you had that positive experience. But I think still why I feel uneasy about shows like this, and we spoke about the, you know, Down With uh, Down with Dating on Netflix yes. last episode. The problem I still have, and, and, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it, I sometimes feel like we as a society, we are not in a place where everyone can watch a show like that or the majority of people can watch a show like that and have a nuanced, respectful, non-ableist approach when watching it. No, I, I think, know what you mean. I did I yeah. did speak about this in The Guardian, um, mm. uh, specifically Down for Love. But mm. my problem is I just hate that society kind of still looks at disabled people in the sense that, oh, I pity them mm -hmm. with these dating shows, you know, kind of thing. But I did highlight as well that it is educational as well. Um, there is people with nuances that want to learn about people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. So there is a plus side to it, but there is a downside because we're still othered in society. Yeah. You know, as you were saying before, the, the continuous discrimination that we face every single day, I just feel like now I'm at a point where it still hurts me because obviously I can't erase it, I can't escape mm -hmm. it. I can't just put a magic cloak on and be invisible to it. But that's why I think it's so important we do what we do every day, educate people, bring awareness, talk about our lived experience so that average height people don't think. So they think about how not to treat us, basically. Mm -hmm. And... Um, through my comedy, I love to do it in a way where it's like I'm making fun out of them and then they can see themselves in that yeah. and then not do it to the next person. That's my way of doing it and I think it definitely works well and I think that's why a lot of people respond to it well. And I love that you've used your platform as just a way to, to highlight and shine a light on issues within society. Yes. Um, but looking at, talking about after the show, so your presence grew. And as well as a content creator, you, like you said, you became a comedian, um, obviously a model and now an author. Congratulations. Yeah. But which is your favourite title or <laughs> title that means the most to you? But to be honest with you, a lot of people would think I would say comedian, but I would say author because people really get to know the crux, the, the meat and bones and crux of me where I explain about my sister and my sisters, I should say, and what got me to where I am today. I think watching a 15 second clip and then people moving on, yeah, they like it at the time, but I think people really reading and spending time getting to know my story, it means so much to me. And the fact that, you know, I've written a whole book, I'm still shocked to this day that <laughs> I have a book. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing it's such an achievement i mean well done main Thank character you. energy yeah. um what i loved about the book as well is that it offers readers like it allows readers to get involved like you actually yes. give like a point like a place for readers to actually write their goals or what to do next or how they should uh, approach a situation it, it just allows the reader to get more involved rather than just read it and it just stay on the surface level yes. they can actually take those lessons on board I just thought in my book i need something like that and yes. I'm, I'm glad it, uh, people have responded to it well and actually writing things in there. Yeah. And I'm like, yes. yes. It's like journaling, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> it's like journaling. I love journaling. Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, very similar, you know, when I wrote my book, it was very cathartic. And I actually learned a lot about my own disability identity. And it kind of like opened a lot of it opened Pandora's box. Some of it was good, some of it was bad. But have you had that kind of same um, enlightening experience? Because writing it myself, I was like, in, I was crying sometimes because I was like, 
transport you back to seven year old smother. Oh, I was like, it wasn't God. your tell fault. Me, tell me about it. Honestly, it's like, you know, when you're just delving into things that you haven't even unpacked mm -hmm. as an adult and I have to explain it in a book, it's it's like just revisiting, like you just said, like you're revisiting your old self. But I knew that it was necessary to speak about these things because that's what I've gone through. That's me. Just because I have to unpack all of these things doesn't mean that I shouldn't write it, you know. Um, but it was hard. It was definitely hard doing that, but it was necessary at the same time. You, you've touched upon comedy and it obviously plays still a really big part of, in your life and I think for, for many disabled people comedy can be a way of deflecting all that negativity, all that ableism and I've definitely used it as a shield, you know, uh, when people make comments about I'm, I'm a power chair user and they go, oh, you know, I've got a driving licence for that. It's like, oh, there that we go. Old, that joke is so that, old. I know. But it's, but it's <laughs> normally... so a, annoying. It's yeah. normally a certain, certain demographic in there and it's like, ha, ha, ha. Mm. But, um, you know, I, I have used it, particularly, I don't know, again, I feel like we're, we're very similar in many, many ways. Like, I would enter a space, whether that's a party or a working environment, and no one would necessarily come up to me and, and introduce themselves. They do now because they're like, oh, you're on the telly. Mm. But prior to that, you know, it would always be me that would have to instigate the conversations. I remember once really? I was... Yeah. I remember once I went on um, a bus and in London, the buses, thank goodness they don't do it anymore. When you press the ramp, it used to go, wheelchair on board. Yeah, wheelchair I know, I know. on board. I, I remember. I, I, honestly, I got on it at seven o'clock in the morning. It was absolutely rammed, central London. Uh, and this, like, and you know, raining. And I, I got I, on, I went, morning! <laughs> like, really loud to everybody. And I and you know I, I I would say that you're a you're naturally comedic you're naturally a bubbly character, but does it ever get to a point where you're like ah oh, do you know what it's I, I can't I can't pander to your uncomfortability or your ignorance anymore? Do you know what I think I still kind of have this I have this thing where because you know how you said like you be bubbly to people and for me I used to wait for people to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And if people don't talk to me, that is fine. I'll be isolated in my corner. But I'm trying my best to change that. I've done, I think like, over the years I've gotten better at it and just speaking to people and just not having any worries. Because I used to think people stare at me, yes, but how are they going to react when I come up to them and speak to them? Oh, my God, that's my worst fear. That's what I used to think. So I try my best to just change that kind of mindset with it because in college in university I was kind of isolated and I do want to um not be that person I've realized if I do that then I'm not going to be able to talk to people I'm not going to be able to tell people that it's okay to be little I'm just I'm literally just little I just have smaller bones I normally end up that, with that conversation being, you know, I'm only little, I'm only a wheelchair user. I am an absolute douchebag. But <laughs> oh, that's, a different, that's a different kettle of fish for another day. Now, let's talk about something that's very dear to my own heart. Fashion. I am I am a self-proclaimed fashionista. And yes, I was it's... absolutely blown away by, first of all, the dress that I saw you wearing because you featured in May's issue of British Vogue. So this was um, a collaborative um, piece from Vogue through Tilting the Lens, obviously with Sinead Burke, and it was reframing fashion. And it featured, I believe, 19 disabled people uh, from all different um, creative industries, so fashion, sport, activism, and the arts. Um, I actually went around lots of different shops to oh, try and get all the different covers of the um, of the the edition of Vogue, just because I want them all over my um, my office when I re re redo my office. So how was that? I mean, I'm not gonna lie, a little bit jealous. <laughs> I was a bit like, wow. I mean, did you get to keep the dress? That's my first question. I did. <gasps> I did. Can I borrow it? <laughs> you, you can if you want. You can. It's an amazing dress. Um, but honestly, I think I collapsed when they asked me because I was just like me doing both when i first started modeling and started doing it more i was like do you know what one day i might do both mm -hmm. i literally said that 
I was like, one day I might do photo getting. I like to say far fetched things just to see if it happens. And it <laughs> did happen in just a few years. Like, it was insane. The people that I worked with, like Sinead, so thankful because it just opened my eyes to what's possible and what change we are making. We're like, we're the ultimate change makers and getting involved with Vogue and just showing people that yes we're disabled but we can look good it's it's just normalizing it that's all I want in life like normalizing disabilities that's it and that's what Vogue helped me do and oh still shocking that I did it I can imagine that you just like, you still wake up and think I did Vogue <laughs> I did <Yeah>. Vogue <laughs> Exactly. And it's beautiful how you spoke it into existence. Like that's just amazing. I, I literally did. I spoke it into existence. I did it in a way where I, I said, "Yeah, one day I'll do Vogue." And there was like a Vogue challenge on TikTok as well. I got involved in that Vogue challenge, and I ended what did up that doing involve? Vogue. What's a Vogue challenge? So it was what was it? So during the pandemic, everyone was just getting pictures of whatever. I'd just put in Vogue on top. Yeah. So they called it the Vogue yeah. Challenge, and at the time, I just used one of my old modelling pictures, and I was wearing white as well. <gasps> so that's that's what a coincidence. Yes. Um, yeah, and then a few years later, I actually did Vogue. Oh, I bet your family it. were so proud. Your family and friends. They were so shocked. They were so shocked. My mum was like, "Wow, I got a Vogue <laughs> model in my house." I was like, "Oh." Yeah, no. yeah, that's it. That's you, it. You made it. You made it. Yes. Um, so t- you mentioned earlier about how you sort of used to isolate yourself, but obviously, fast forward to today, like your confidence just seems astronomical. Um, would you agree that confidence is a journey and not a destination? That like you're always working it's to be confident. Always. I always refer it to a muscle. If you keep, if you keep working that muscle, it will get stronger. If you stop working that muscle, it will get weaker. Mm. Um, and that's how you have to see confidence. I wouldn't say you're always going to be 100%, but as long as you're working on it, doing new things, breaking boundaries, your confidence will always grow. Uh, there's probably going to be a lot of um, young disabled people listening to this podcast because we are down with the kids, clearly. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. And they may be thinking, okay, yeah, fair enough, easy said than done because you've done this and you, you've got that platform and and so on and so forth. And I think, you know, there is sometimes, and I'm very mindful of it every time I put anything out there, that disability looks and feels so different for everyone, whether that is because of your physical disability or whether that's, you know, because you don't have the right support package in place, you know, because things like that can be so subjective, you know, depending on where you live, whether you, you know, you still live at home, whether you want to try and move out and be independent, you know, or whether you're you're an ambulatory uh, wheelchair user, there's so many variables. And I think it's it can be quite challenging to go, well, I've done it. So, you know, this is your yeah. role model. So what advice would you give to to our community? and to people who may may look at you and go okay well it worked for you but I know it won't work for for me it's true I completely agree with you because everyone's got their own journeys it's one of those things where I think if they have the right support network or if they don't they need to find it in a counsellor or a therapist or teachers to to help them with the mindset that they need reading books oh my god Reading books was my stepping stone to to even thinking positively because before that, I thought life was hell. I thought life was, why, why am I working? Why am I living? You know, I just thought um, I was in a very dark place and reading self-help books like The Secret, learning how to manifest with whatever is around you or whatever you have, it was something that was out of the ordinary and I thought okay let me give it a try because I want to do anything to get out of this mindset I want to do anything to get out of this state so um all those things can all these things that you might not have ever thought of or might not have ever like had the tools to know about even social media though like what I always say is you know social media is free 
you know, it's there and it's something that you you can use and experiment and really feel for what what you feel comfortable with and it connects you yeah. to so many people. I never really knew any disabled people before social media. I mean, a lot Same. of that came from my own prejudice. A lot of it came from my own internalized ableism where I was like, ew, disabled people. I mean, I'm happy Same. with me, but I don't really like I'm them telling you, I them. feel like every disabled person has gone yeah. through this, especially not having any representation mm -hmm. to look up to. And then when you actually do see it, it's like, I'm not one of them. Yeah. Uh, excuse me? Mm, yeah. <laughs> when, when I look back and I think, oh my God, I can't, I can't face a little person. I can't mm. sit, what? Mm. <laughs> like, it's crazy. And I think, yes, yeah, because of our own internalized ableism that has been put onto us, mm -hmm. we just learnt behavior. Mm -hmm. So I'm so thankful for social media. I'm so thankful that when I have a child, if whether they're little or not, they're gonna be educated on what it's like to be a little person, they're going to have little people around. They're going to have a little person mum, you know. So it's way different to how we grew up. I love that. Just yeah. the thought that you're just a role model. Yeah. So Fats, we have a tradition going on where our previous guest asked um, a question to our next guest. So our previous guest asks you, um, whatever you're working on right now, what do you think makes it innovative? What makes it innovative is... I don't want to give a lazy answer because it's me, but <laughs> I don't know. It can be because you. It's me, yeah. Because yeah. it's me, I have to think of innovative ways to do things, yeah. get things done, to partake in things. Mm -hmm. So in the same scheme of things, have you got a question for our next guest? I think I want to ask, what's the best part of having a disability Amazing. because we love to talk about the negatives that negativity that comes our way but i love having a disability i love being different now i i, I embrace it so much now people stare at me yes but i look good yes. while she's <laughs> yes. staring at me i look good so it's fine oh I love, I love that. that question and it's been such a pleasure fat thank you so much honestly keep being great and hopefully you'll come back and talk to us whether yeah. that be in the magazine or on the podcast again so yeah i'm definitely yes. keeping in touch i'll be booking in for tiktok tutorials <laughs> from you yeah let me know what your hourly do. rate is my love i'll be around i will let you know be around with the car carrot know, cake darling. carrot cake and tea <laughs> That's not a bad so, idea, oops, actually. I love a cheeky, I love a cheeky carrot cake. I love a cheeky carrot cake. <laughs> okay. Yeah, see, I'll be knocking oh, on your door, my darling. But thank you so much, guys. It's been a you. pleasure. Thank you. thank you so much. Take care, my lovely. What time is it, Sam? Culture with me. <laughs> <laughs> Try to do Mariah Carey. I mean, the fact that I feel like the bottom of someone's shoe right now that was impressive oh, i appreciate the effort yeah i did it just for you matt <laughs> and so what are we with today what are today we uh so we are talking about electric cars so we chatted recently with Catherine maris head of mm -hmm. innovation at motability about the, the brilliant work they're doing in improving uh, accessibility around electric cars and electric car charging um but often when we're at events i get a lot of questions from people on the scheme who just don't I just aren't aware of the basics of electric cars. So we're just going to cover some of the sort of basics today and a lot of some of the common questions I get that will hopefully at least make people feel like they can make an informed decision on whether or not they even want to start looking at electric cars. Um, so, for example, I mean, some of the things I get asked are things like, oh, can you put an electric car through a car wash or can you plug it in to charge it while it's raining and things like that? And you absolutely can. Like, of course you can. Um, but, you know, they're, they're perfectly reasonable questions to ask if you don't know. Valid. But yeah, so I, I think I think the most important question to start with is can you charge at home? Um, because that, that changes things quite drastically. So charging at home is the most cost effective way to run an electric car by mm -hmm. some margin. But it's also the most convenient, right? Um, one of the great things about the Motability Scheme is that they will cover the cost of a standard installation of, a, of an electric car charger at your house, which is really good because they, they think you cost a reasonable amount of money. So if you can get that for free, that's fantastic. Now, the reason they're cheaper is that, or obviously it just uses your home electricity tariff. Now, the average electricity price in the UK, is, so people often ask me, how much does it cost to charge an electric car? And that's a really hard question to mm -hmm. answer because how long is a piece of string? Mm -hmm. If you imagine a petrol car, 
and someone asks you that, well, it would depend mm -hmm. on how big the car's petrol tank is and it would depend how much the petrol station is selling fuel for, right? Um, so similar thing applies with electric cars. It depends on the cost of the electricity and it depends on how big the battery is in your car. So if you imagine average fuel prices in the UK at the moment are about uh, 34 pence per kilowatt hour uh, and a sort of normal size battery in an electric car is about 60 kilowatts. Um, 60 kilowatt hours, I should say, uh, then that brings you to about sort of 20 pounds to charge that. But the bit where it gets interesting is if you can charge at home, lots of energy companies do special EV tariffs or they just have general tariffs where electricity is cheaper at night when demand is low. Mm. And it's usually quite substantially cheaper at that time. Yeah, the washing machine, isn't yeah. it? They say do your washing at night. There you go. It's, and it's exactly the same principle. And that actually can drastically reduce the cost of running an electric car. Can I play devil's advocate, though? You absolutely can. Um, because all these things go through my mind, I'm sure it will through other people's minds. That's all handy dandy mm. if you've got a drive or you've is, got... Yeah. But what if you live in a flat or a, or a terrace? Um, so then I guess you'd be looking at charging your car using public chargers. Mm. Motability does offer something where you can get a subscription to the BP Pulse network. So for people who can't charge at home, instead you can, you can have a, a subscription to this network and that gives you a better rate on charging. So it's probably still not, it's not going to be as cheap as charging at home, but it, it, it helps out a little bit. But yeah, in an ideal world, charging at home is just the cheapest and most convenient way to do it and unfortunately not everyone could do that so that is a shame if you do charge from home and you can get one of those ev tariffs you, you can charge a car for as little as four pounds fifty very cheap that sounds very cheap because you can yeah, about filling your tank mm -hmm. oh yeah you're looking at mm -hmm. like hundreds is that in comparison is that, i feel like yeah, it sounds too good to be oh, no, true it's about, i mean yeah i'm yeah. just like yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's yeah. hard to compare but then uh, and prices do vary because like i said if you if you were to if you didn't have one of those EV tariffs and you're using your normal energy tariff, it'd be more like, say, £20, yeah. which is suddenly not, actually, you know, yeah. suddenly a lot closer to, yeah. to putting your petrol whatever in your car. Um, but yeah, it is cheaper. And I bear in mind a tank of fuel will take you further than 200 yeah. miles, but not, you know, yeah. £4.50. Yeah, Ooh. exactly. Um, and can you overcharge? Like, so no. can you over, so should you let it run down quite substantially and then charge yeah. it up? Like, don't be topping it up even if you've, mm. you know, it's gone down a little bit. This is one of those things that, that, you know, lots of people say different things and, uh, and it's hard to actually work out how much of a difference it makes. But they do advise that you don't always charge it up mm -hmm. if you don't need to. Like rather than say, because uh, as I sort of mentioned before in the podcast, the average mile, average daily mileage in the UK is around 20 miles. Yeah. And if you think a car can do 200 or 300 mm -hmm. miles, that's only a very small percentage of the battery. So what you don't really want to be doing is going out and just recharging Charging. every day from 95% to 100, mm -hmm. 95 yeah. to 100. It's a fear though. People still have fear. Yeah. And they'll be like, I need to do it. I need to do it just in case. Just in case. Again, I keep thinking about my power chair, but I'm like, when I get to 40%, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I've never been this low. Yeah. I've never been this low. And I'm halfway up to some weight trolls. What do I do? <laughs> Turn back or just go and get the expensive cat food. <laughs> like, what, what do I do? <laughs> no, that is ra range anxiety, yeah. that's called. Is that what it uh, is? Yeah, range anxiety is a, wow. is a thing in the, in the EV that's world. Wow, that's me a lot. So people do diagnosed. panic. Um, but yeah, it, you know, it's something you get used to once you've been driving them for a while. You know, you know what your car can do, and um, and there are lots. You know, if you are out and about and you're low on battery, there are lots of places mm -hmm. you can charge your car in public that are very fast. Um, but we'll, uh, we'll we'll get to that in a moment. But you can you can also actually, if you're charging from home, even if you don't have a home charger installed for whatever reason, you can do uh, something that's called granny charging uh, using a granny charger. Uh, I, I thought there was some technical reason for this, but apparently it's it's just called a granny charger because it's a charge you'd use if you were visiting your gran. For oh, it's like, I, I don't know why. I was like, is there a bit of ageism here? <laughs> yeah. What's going on? Yeah, for some reason it's known as granny charging, and that's where you can actually charge your car by plugging it into a normal three point socket. Oh wow! Oh. But it, it's generally not. Advisable. I was say, yeah. but how long that take? In, in theory, in theory, it's safe, but I think a it's it does put a lot of pressure yeah. on your household electric, so it's not always advisable. I think they generally recommend you don't unless you have to, um, and also it does take a long time, as, as mm -hmm. Sam just asked. Um, yeah, you're looking at about probably about 30, it obviously it varies, but you look at about yeah. thirty hours for okay. like a kind of average size electric. Would the cost be the same? Because yeah, it's still coming okay. from your home electric. Okay. Same okay. thing. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, getting back to whether or not you should look at an electric car, um, the next thing to think about is actually the, the car itself and how you use your car and whether it would suit your needs. So, you know, do you go on a lot of long journeys? And if so, you want a car with a bigger battery. If you mostly cover short journeys, you could maybe, um, you know, save a bit of money or, or be able to get a smaller, lighter car that's, that doesn't 
need a huge battery if you mostly just do, do journeys around town. That's I just had another question. So yeah. if you live really remote or in a very yes. rural area, that's something else you need to consider for getting an electric car, don't Absolutely. you? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that actually sort of brings me on to our next point actually, which is to check the, the charging infrastructure around your area. So, you know, hopefully you could still charge a car at home. If you lived in a rural mm. area, the chances are if you're rural, there's a larger chance that you've mm. got off-road off parking, which yeah. is great. Yeah. But yeah, it's the public charging that then becomes more difficult. I think the first thing to remember is a lot of these cars could do 200 miles on a charge, right? And some can do 300. And if you think 200 miles is like driving from London to Manchester, that's a long yeah, way. So, long way. you know, it, that's a long way. And, and the chances are, even if you live somewhere rural, if, you could, if you're driving that far, yeah. you will end up passing through somewhere, somewhere. That, that has fast chargers. But yeah, that, that is something to consider if you have a car that, that, mm. that, that doesn't go as far or if, or more importantly, if you're driving to somewhere yes. rural. So when you get there and your battery yes. is low. So right, if you're doing long journeys in electric cars, it does require a bit yeah. of planning. There are some really useful tools for that. There's uh, something called ZapMap which is one of the most popular ones. And that gives you a map of the UK and tells you where all of the charges are. And it also tells you how fast they are. And it tells you whether they've been in use recently, whether they're currently being used. People can leave comments on there and say, this one is rubbish, it rarely works. Or they can say, there's no cover here, so if it rains, you're gonna get wet. Uh, and sometimes people actually leave accessibility comments on there, which is that on the internet, I just worry about people who aren't tech savvy, internet mm. savvy. And I think we need to be very mindful that yeah. not everybody knows how to you know, be, be fluent of navigating yes. social media. I mean, when my mum found out how to use emojis, it was like the end of my life <laughs> as I knew it because all of a sudden it was just emojis. <laughs> um, yeah, so what about that? I, I feel like mm. it might be excluding a certain demographic. There is, yeah, there is an argument about that. One of the things that is going to make it easier, lots more cars now are adding a feature within the sat-nav mm. where if you're going on a long journey and you put in, uh, oh, I've got to go to here, the car will know if you're going to need to charge on the way and it can add a charging spot on route, oh, I like which that. actually makes life a lot That's easier. Amazing. So it, it takes a bit of the thought yeah. out of it. I just had one question. You know, like with a phone, you can carry like a, a charging bank with you. Is there anything yeah. like that for an electric car? So this is a question I get asked is, uh, what happens when you run out yeah. of battery, right? Um, it's very rare that will happen because the car will give you lots of warnings. It's yeah. not just going to suddenly yeah, stop. stop yeah. Um, and even if you run out, it, it goes into like a sort of limp mode okay. where you can drive really slowly and hopefully either get out of the way yes. or to safety or just get to a charge. Hopefully. But it's say, say the worst <laughs> happens and that, and that you, you don't and you're stranded. The RAC now are equipped with vans for electric vehicles. Nice. Um, and they can either A, sort of tow you somewhere, but tow you properly. Uh, or B, uh, some of them have a sort of quick charging system that can give you enough juice to say travel 10 oh, wow. miles. Okay. So it can just get you to the nearest fast okay. charger. So yeah, that, that has been thought of. Not something you can carry around yourself because the size of the battery <laughs> you'd need would be enormous yeah. and so heavy. But um, I didn't know that, so that's really good. And yeah. you get the RA membership as part Absolutely. of your RA free package I with motability. That. I mean, that kind of covers the, most of the common questions. The other one is how long does it take to charge an electric car? And again, there's lots of answers to that question, but the real simple terms, and I'm going to generalise and say this is like a car with an average size battery. because you've got about 30 seconds. That's it, I'm going to get cut off. Right, if you're charging from home, it probably takes about 10 hours, but oh, okay. you're not going to be coming home with an empty battery all the time, so that's what people need to remember most of the time you're coming home, it's still going to be mostly full. Uh, if you're charging in public, there are rapid chargers that go from anywhere from 50 to 150 to 350 kilowatts, they're ultra rapid. Um, and then it comes down to how fast your car can accept a charge. So generally Ooh. most cars, yeah, so there's sort of two things at play here. A 50 kilowatt charger will generally get you up to 80% battery in around sort of 40 to 50 minutes, which is quite good. Uh, there are some new cars that have just been added to the scheme that have something called 800 volt architecture, which means they can charge really fast. If you've got one of those and you're lucky enough to find a 350 kilowatt charger, which are still quite rare, you can be from up to 80% battery in around 18 minutes, which is wow. actually rather snappy. That is yeah. snappy. But expect us to pay a bit more for that. Yeah. So <laughs> a pumpkin <laughs> spice latte rapid, <laughs> that, that's... That's what I'm I think about. I think the most important thing to say as well is go and test drive one. Yes. Because if you haven't driven one, I think most people will actually prefer the way they drive yeah. to a normal car. Yeah. They're smoother, they're quicker, and they're quieter. Yeah. And and they're all automatic. Yeah. So I think most people actually enjoy driving mm. one. So give one a try. Check that the, your whatever adaptations you need are compatible with an EV. Check that a hoist will fit, for example, because sometimes the boots can be a little bit smaller on electric mm. cars because of the way mm. the batteries are positioned. Not always. Mm. Um, so check that a hoist will work if you need one. Mm. 
And those are kind of the main bits to get you going. And our gadget. Have we got oh, gosh, a quick gadget? Gadget. Gadget. Okay. Quick gadget. It's practical today. So we've all been there. You sit in the car, your change, wallet, phone, falls out your pocket, goes down the side, and it's impossible to yep. recover, and you're never, ever going to see it again. <laughs> uh, and and I, I can only imagine how difficult that is for people with, like, yeah. you know, limited movement totally. and mobility. Um, so there is something you can get. There's, I mean, there are certain brand names, but the general term is a car seat gap filler. Very catchy ah. terminology, but it's effectively like a, uh, it's sort of made of foam and you, it goes over where the seatbelt would be and it just fills that gap next to your pockets and, and between the door and between the gear stick and whatnot. So that if anything falls out, it doesn't sink into the never realm, never to be seen That's again. That's amazing. That's really handy. It's not, for, it's not for concealing anything that should not be in your car. <laughs> I can nice. imagine there might be some uh, young uns out there. Oh, and that's it for today's episode of the Motability Lifestyle Pod. Thanks to Matt Lizzie Moore with his car You're chat welcome. today and our guest, Fats Timbo. Thanks to our producer, Yelaine Goffin at Rethink Audio and to our editorial assistant, Lucy Rose at Wonderly. If you like this episode, then give us a follow. Tell all your friends and please do leave a review. If you want to tell us what you thought or if there's something you'd like to hear from us, come and say a hello on Instagram for some behind-the-scenes content or follow us on TikTok. I'm sure Fats will be over there, won't she? And watch the full video on YouTube. You can find us on Motability underscore Lifestyle underscore Mag. Finally, if you want more information about the Motability schemes, go to motability.co.uk. Or if you want to learn more about Motability, the foundation, visit motability.org.uk. And that's it, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Samantha Rank. And I'm Sophie Marie Odom. See you in the cement. Bye. <laughs>